Welcome to the HPC Best of Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the XA Scale Computing Project of the United States Department, Department of Energy. I'm Mosley Marcus from the Los Berkeley National Laboratory, and I will be the host for today's webinar, Open Escapes, Supporting Better Science for Future Us. The webinar will be presented by Julia Stewart Londis. I have seen the slides, the dry run, it's uh, very nice. We're going to see very nice things here today. So Julia is the founding director of Open Escapes. She's a marine ecologist and champion for making science more open, efficient, inclusive, and kind. She works at the intersection of actionable environmental, environmental science, data science, and uh, open science. She's a Mozilla Fellow, National Science Foundation Better Scientific Software Fellow, and also Senior Fellow at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She earned her PhD from Stanford University in uh, 2012, studying drivers and impacts of Humboldt squid in a changing climate. I had no idea of that kind of squid it was so big, and I think you'll see Julia holding one of them. I'll stop my sharing here. Julia, you take over, please. And I think you are. Great. You're good. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Osni. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I will go ahead and share my slides. I think thumbs up if I think you can see these. Yep. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to um, talk about Openscapes and supporting better science for future us. And yeah, thanks again for the invitation and um, having me at this webinar. Um, at Openscapes, we believe open science can accelerate interoperable data-driven solutions and increase diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in research and beyond. Um, and the purpose of today's talk is to share the open science mindset and some tooling with you and to welcome you to this broader movement. So we'll we'll be seeing a lot of different themes um, and sort of re-examining them deeper and deeper through different stories and examples throughout the um, throughout the presentation. Um, so first of all, to define better science for future us, we think about better science as being science that's more open and transparent, more reproducible, efficient, interoperable, and resilient. And also it's more diverse, equitable, inclusive, and kind. And we have defined future us as thinking about ourselves as well as our teams and broader communities that we might not know yet. And thinking about these, you know, thinking about us in that way on different timescales. So in the next hour, in the next week, in the next decades. And so this is a mindset that's really important, um, particularly in environmental science, where we're looking at how things are changing through time and predicting things in, in the future. Um, but it's relevant for all kinds of science and, and beyond. Um, but this type of mindset is also a real time, it's a real investment. Um, it's an investment in time, in patience, in learning, in, and in resources. And this is especially true for data intensive research. So to um, give a little bit of a, a little bit more of a uh, background of who I am, um, like Osni said, I'm a marine ecologist and I'm an Openscapes founder. And um, Openscapes, as we'll continue to see, it, it, the real focus is helping research teams transition to inclusive open science and data intensive workflows. Um, so you'll see that Openscapes mentors teams um, through these through these approaches to be, so they can better tackle their questions by strengthening shared practices that are underpinned by tools that exist already. And the motivation for Openscapes is really from my team's own um, experience doing data intensive marine science. And we really found out the hard way that our default approaches to how we were working with data and code and collaborating with software Made, that, made our research not reproducible even by ourselves. And so I became an open science community member, particularly um, through the R community, uh, which is a computer programming language. And that's really where I learned inclusive peer learning. Uh, I saw role modeled teaching and, um, and really community building across disciplines and career stages. So I want to address this photo here. This is me um, doing my PhD research uh, back in 2009. And, and like Osni said, this, I'm holding a squid. Um, 
that is, you know, quite nearly as big as I am. There's a, its arms are kind of on the right side as I'm about to put it back into the water um, off the edge of a boat. You can see my colleague, John Field, holding on to me. Um, and there's a satellite tag attached to the sort of foreground of the squid to its fin. And that tag was going to travel with this squid as it swam throughout the Pacific Ocean. It's collecting data every second so that we can see where the squid is, what the temperature of the water is. You can actually see these animals breathing um, because of the way squids move. Um, and we were going to be combining this with satellite data and remotely operated vehicle data to understand how this squid, which is the largest squid, the, the largest invertebrate fishery in the world, um, but also one of the top four um, fisheries in the world by biomass. Um, so that's all to say it's a very economically and ecologically critical species. We were going to be able to learn where this thing was swimming and, and going. It was really exciting. But I really soon felt demoralized by this, um, by my research, because when I got the data back, I couldn't analyze it with the tool sets I have. This is a feeling that is happening across science all the time in big ways and small ways where we are facing a challenge that we can't solve with the skill sets we have. And it's, it makes us feel like Luke Skywalker here when he's crashed his plane into the swamp of Dagobah. But the good thing is, is that there's other approaches that can help us um, think about these problems in a whole new way. If you think about how um, you know, Yoda comes along and is able to solve Luke's problem in a way that Luke never imagined was possible. And Luke is gonna be able to see that this whole new approach exists and he's gonna be able to learn it and, and take it forward to tackle challenges on a scale he can't even imagine. So for me, this was open science and coding and seeing mentors who are software developers and seeing this whole new way of working that I hadn't experienced in the marine science community yet. But the important thing here too is, you know, Luke doesn't go on to save the empire by himself. It is a whole team effort. And there are such a diversity of skills and activities and ideas that are brought together. And that's really what made um, it, it possible, in, you know, for, for the Star Wars story to succeed, but it's also what's making it, what's going to make it possible in science and climate solutions to succeed. So through open science and, um, and mentors and coding, um, I really felt empowered um, to do this myself for my own research and to share these practices more broadly with other researchers. So over the last 10 years, um, I have built confidence um, as an open science contributor and leader through a lot of different activities and opportunities in the open science world, um, particularly through the R community as, as you'll see kind of listed here, um, and it, as well as the Mozilla community. And this really you know, culminates in, in our work with OpenScapes, with, with, which is what we're gonna continue talking about today. Um, but as we but as we go there, you know, the open science is something I haven't quite defined yet, and we think about it as a movement. Um, it's a movement that's happening globally across science, and it's not only about improving the way we share data and methods, but it's about improving the way we think and work and interact with each other. So it's really a, this like beautiful interaction of technology that's enabling social social infrastructure. Um, and influencing technology and all of that towards kinder science and more collaborative and inclusive science. So open science is this movement um, within science and it's, you know, it's, it's happening, um, you know, across disciplines within science. It's also, um, you know, open healthcare is an example, open government are other efforts in this broader movement. And the COVID-19 pandemic is a really interesting example of open science in action as folks are sharing data in real time code, you know, reusing uh, map building and predicting things. So it's, you know, this, this idea of the tools that we have and the culture we can create with that around collaboration is really exciting for open science. And there's also other movements going on in the world where that we can align with and learn from. One in particular that we're really um, dedicated to is the climate movement and the idea that to, to address our climate emergency, we must rapidly, radically reshape society. We need every solution and every solver. Um, this is you know, what we see as possible through open science and collaborative ideas. 
Um, so let's think about, let's take a, a breather and talk about our goals for today. Um, I would love to share, um, talk, first talk about movement building and to share stories of open science for climate through a lot of the collaborators and leaders we have in the OpenScapes community. Um, and then I'll do a short skill building demo um, using software called Porto that you'll see examples of um, throughout the stories. Um, and then we'll, we'll end with how you can help your colleagues um, develop this mindset and, and join the movement um, as well. And I also just wanted to, to um, directly say why this is relevant to the exascale community. And really it's, um, we think about it because um, computing skills are really critical for science and society across so many different facets of what's possible today. And we really have been hampered by inequity about who is welcome to access these, um, you know, what's possible with code and software. Um, and this is something that we, we are working to change and want to invite you to help us change as well. And these are a few references listed here um, that show that um, the, the biggest unmet need in analyzing biological big data, whether this is genomic data or you know, COVID uh, data throughout the globe is skills. Um, the biggest unmet need for, for analyzing data are, are skills around coding. And this is a paper you know, that it's referenced from 2017 and a follow-up paper by, the, by a lot of people from that same group um, in 2019 showed that the barriers to helping teach coding in bioinformatics courses is that the faculty and scientists that are coding themselves don't feel qualified to teach it to students. So even folks that are, you know, a lot of us are self-taught and there's a need to support us in teaching and also helping have that culture, um, you know, change so that we can all feel empowered to teach even if we don't have formal training as uh, computer scientists. Um, and the last uh, quote here it shows that, um, this is by Ruha Benjamin, that um, technology can exacerbate inequities if the corresponding social infrastructure is not in place. So just thinking about how to be deliberate about how we can welcome more folks into this you know, wonderful world of coding and open science and possibilities. Okay, so let's um, go ahead with, with OpenScapes. Um, so, with OpenScapes, we think of open science as this beautiful landscape with many existing paths forward, full of code and data and communities. And what we do is we help researchers move from the lonely science, um, like these illustrated by these animals in the bottom left corner, and towards uh, more collaborative open science as they navigate this landscape together safely with their teams. And in terms of safety here, we're thinking of like less trampling, less time being stuck in a roadblock. Um, but you know, the metaphors carry into open science and coding. And, and what we do with OpenScapes is we, um, we meet folks at the trailhead and welcome them, help them sort of see what's possible in this landscape and get on those paths together. Um, so we, we help them often, you know, see, you know, we introduce them to this landscape and also help them see that the folks around them can be part of their team and they don't have to do this alone. Um, so we think of this as engaging, empowering and amplifying folks around all of these practices. And our main activity um, is that we mentor uh, professional research groups um, and we're really focused on transforming the collaborative work practices, like the daily work practices that enable these climate solutions on all different scales. Um, we've worked with um, over 700 people so far um, throughout government and, um, and academia and nonprofits. And we really, uh, we've, we've been learning a lot from these different movements that I was describing before and um, have something that's kind of not your, your traditional training or workshop. It's, cohort based, it's remote sessions, and it's really about getting stuff done um, that you already have on your plate, but having to weave new ideas and practices and skills into your daily work so that you can be more efficient. Um, and there's also a sustainability and scalability built in. Um, we're really interested in 
developing teaching and learning cultures within different organizations, whether it's a la an academic lab group or an organization like, like NASA Earth Data. Um, and the idea is that folks can support and help each other um, to change this culture. Um, and so to that point, uh, we really focus on how culture change requires, you know, it's, it's technical and it's human. It's about developing skills and mindsets in the same people so that you can transition, you can see that you're stuck and see that you could be a part of, um, you know, you could learn a system like, um, you know, having a tidier workbench and that that's something that you can actually do to share and teach and interoperate and work with others. To kind of develop these mindsets of, of seeing where you're stuck, learning and sharing as you go. So I wanted to um, share some specific stories through, uh, and, and the way we were gonna do it is to organize it through some of the values that have emerged as we've worked with all of these groups. Um, so we'll walk through as many of these as we can before I, I switch off or I, or I uh, switch to the demo. Um, but just to sort of as a disclaimer, there's, there's so many amazing um, people we work with and stories to tell. So this is a very small subset and each story um, will be able to kind of cross all of these categories in one way or another. So I'm gonna have to really work to limit to the, the point. Um, and it was also in, um, inspired in, in large part to some of the work that Abby Kubonak Mays has done um, with Mozilla Open Leaders too. Okay, so the first one is the idea that open science is a process um, and it's something that can inspire and empower folks. And I think that, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, open science can be thought of as products, like as data or code. And so this idea that it's also a process and it's got this human side of it is, is really, um, is really a, a value that uh, has come has surfaced for us. And uh, the story with Ileana Fenwick helps illustrate this in a beautiful way. So Ileana is a PhD candidate at the University of North Carolina, and she's part of the core OpenScapes team. And she, this is a slide from one of her presentations showing how, how it started on, on the left there where she's kind of tangled with a lot of files that she's hand curating um, to have different versions of them and how that led to a lot of lost time and data and frustration. And that through seeing what was possible in that you know, open science landscape, she is now not only improving her own fisheries research, but she's also amplifying um, what she's learned to broader communities. So she, on the, on the right here, she's telling her story and inspiring others through the Black and Marine Science, um, uh, we, uh, Black and Marine Science Weeks. And um, she also gave a talk at our studio conference about her journey and how data science tools for equity, diversity, um, for equity and diversity in STEM. So her, so her, um, story of seeing what's possible and then amplifying that as a process is just is phenomenal. And she now has um, her first grant to lead a event series for Black marine scientists in partnership with um, Black women in ecology, evolution and marine science and Black and marine science that they're kicking off this month. So this so is a like, beautiful story of seeing open science as an activity that you can participate in and then amplifying this beyond. Um, the next value is this future us mindset. And I know um, I defined it a little bit at the very beginning, um, but it's, it's really something that you, you, you don't do alone. You know, you do, you develop this mindset by thinking about this with colleagues and talking about this with colleagues. And so prioritizing that time to talk with colleagues and having some kind of structure or, or place to, to work together as you, as you talk about things is really important. So Adian Rios is a marine ecologist at the NOAA Southeast Fisheries Science Center. And she, this is a slide from one of her talks where she's talk, she's introducing the concept of their surf sessions at the Fisheries Science Center. And what they, these are, these are hour long 
meetings virtual that are um, welcome to everybody at their at their science center who are all dispersed. And the goal here is to create digital and physical spaces where their group members, despite having differing research questions and expertise and you know tasks on their to-do lists, it's a space where they feel comfortable discussing data challenges and seeking, offering, and accepting guidance from each other. And these surf sessions that Audi leads are have just been really important for the culture of at the um, at the science center and for people getting their work done. Audi, like many folks, onboarded to a new job during the pandemic and you know didn't really know how to meet people or learn what other people are doing or learn how she could contribute or how people might know things that could help her. And so having this on the calendar um, that everyone was invited to and that you knew that there would be kind of a, a Google doc that um, had some you know, a little bit of an agenda enough so there was a place to like paste screenshots or paste links or it was a culture where you can screen share with each other and show your error message. It was a place that really not only helped um, build this kind of future us mindset, but also is, is helping create this learning culture at the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, this next value is the power of yet. Um, and this is really part of the growth mindset body of work that Carol Dweck has done. Um, she's at Stanford University. This is the idea that we can all continue learning and just because um, you haven't seen something before doesn't mean that you can't practice it, learn it, and, and contribute. Um, so this is a really important mindset for folks that have not been exposed to coding before um, in particular, and just kind of having this, this power of yet mindset when you know, software is continuing to change. Um, so this example, um, is with the Alaska Fisheries Science and Alaska Fisheries Science Center Marine Mammal Lab, and this is a this is a team that um, really embodies the power of yet. They um, this this is a slide from one of their presentations where they show that well, first of all, they practiced what we just saw with those um, deliberate meetings where you can screen share with each other, learn where each other are, um, and figure out how to interoperate more broadly with each other. So they took they started having those regular meetings within their team and kind of found kind of the edges of their scopes of work and how they could help interoperate more easily between uh, this creating reports every year together. Um, so where those handoffs were with data or with drafts of Word documents, um, that kind of thing, they decided, you know, they, they kind of saw where those edges were and decided to learn GitHub together in order so that you could use it for version control and for communication. Um, they also, in this example, in this screenshot here, um, started to use R more extensively for, on the left side here, they started to make maps and figures directly from R. And this was a huge step because in the past there were, you know, if there were six different people making that were going to have a map at different parts of the reports, there would be like 10 different ways of making that map. And now there is code that creates the map you need and you can, um, you know, modify it as however you need in R. And then the second part that is such an exciting part, example of um, this growth mindset is they also started using this brand new software called Quarto. And what this lets you do is have your code and text and outputs in the same um, text document called a Quarto document. And then that can uh, be rendered into HTML or a .x or a PDF. Um, and so this let them, they saw this, and this was like the power of yet, like how can we build our workflows into this um, shared system that will make this more reproducible, make it easier for us to collaborate across responsibilities and skills and tee us up for success more in the years to come. So this is just a, you know, there's so much more to say about, um, about this group. Um, and we'll explore this idea of Quarto um, a bit more in the demo later as well. Okay. <laughs> um, 
onboarding learners as contributors is another really important concept that's come up um, through our work. And Gavin Fay's group at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth is a phenomenal example of this. The Fay Lab manual, which is on the right side of this, uh, one of Gavin's slides here, is, is like a famous um, document. Um, it is a openly created um, manual of how the lab works, like how, how to onboard people to the lab. And so it puts up front lab culture and philosophy, a code of conduct, um, and they consider onboarding not only like where your desk is and where, you know, here are your keys. It's about like, we, we have a folder here where we keep our, our data. These are where our presentations are, please reuse them. Um, we use R and these are the packages we've made for our work. Like, here's how you can learn R so that you can be part of this, you know, infrastructure that we've created. Um, and the reason, you know, this, I said this manual is, is famous. It's like, this is a radical idea in science that you're, you're creating this documentation that's open and out there and learners as they read it are not only um, learning how to, you know, contribute to where they're gonna put their data, they're also learning how to edit this manual using GitHub and Quarto. And they're able to contribute to it on day one as they're reading this, they can fix a typo or add a new link or you know embellish like a detail that they think is is there. So you know it's, it's this idea that like a learner can actually contribute to science on day one. And with that kind of mindset, it's it's just like it's so exciting to think about where this will lead science. Um, that you know traditionally you have to wait several years as a new come to a lab before you kind of have a voice in science before you can peer review, you know publish peer review this is a way you can contribute openly and bring your expertise um, on day one and it's just it's just so exciting um the other part of this slide shows or uh, yeah of Gavin's slide here shows that they also use github issues as a searchable repository for tips and tricks and new uh, group knowledge so this is another way that they're kind of onboarding um, new learners as, in a format that helps helps them contribute and helps them learn um, software as well as these concepts that are written through there. Um, slowing down to speed up is a, another big concept um, that comes through. And this is also about meeting people where they are. Um, this is, this is a wonderful example from the viability report team at the NOAA Fisheries Northwest Center um, led by Eli Holmes and how they focused a lot of their team building, their, their, um, their sort of surfside meetings or seaside chats or you know, whatever they, they called those meetings. They focused on kind of what their current workflows look like right now and who does what so that they could then figure out how to streamline this. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to try to be a little less less detailed about all these stories as we go forward. Um, but I do want to share the, this next one to make um, the implicit explicit. Um, and this is this is the idea that we don't assume what skills people have on a team. Um, we're able to ask questions about um, in a you know in a safe space like if people are comfortable using this type of software or um, actually just taking the initiative to demo or screen share something that might not be, um, you know, you can't assume that somebody might know. And this, this came through in a couple places in our NASA OpenScapes work. Um, this is a screenshot of a recent poster pub publication um, that they presented it, um, at eight, uh, a big conference last month. This idea here is that this is a, this is a really wonderful project where um, we are supporting NASA Earth science teams to migrate their analytical workflows to the cloud as all of NASA Earth science, NASA Earth data's archives migrate to the cloud as well. 
So this is a huge, this is a three-year project um, that is a wonderful collaboration with NASA and their 12 data centers um, where historically researchers had downloaded data individually from these 12 different places. Um, and now that the data will be available in the cloud, there's gonna be one unified system for researchers to access the data in one place. And our work with, with this group is to help those 12 data centers collaborate and upskill and, and learn about how to support researchers in the cloud. And the, the, the story here about making the implicit explicit is that you know, we couldn't, we actually walked in and assumed that folks had experienced working in the cloud themselves already. And something we learned was that that was some, you know, and, and we felt pretty uncomfortable. I, I have not, I had not worked in the cloud before. Um, and, and without saying out loud, like, you know, have, have folks worked in the cloud before, we realized that this was a need and were able to um, collaborate with a group called 2i2c to establish a Jupiter hub. And we all learned how to work in Jupiter notebooks and create um, Python environments and all of that so that we could support this research. So, but I think, you know, having, being able to have those conversations and having kind of that space and place where you're building trust and being able to talk about what we, like what are what the needs actually are is a really important part of of the work that we do. So this this slide then goes on to show how um, this arc is on this left side, how our NASA Openscapes community of mentors um, then were able to um, help teach other folks at um, who are staff at their data centers. And from there then um, support end users who are researchers and then also contribute back to this open science community more broadly in terms of resources and teaching. So this is kind of movement building in action that is um, that is really founded on this idea of making the implicit explicit and being able to identify um, and support where the needs are. Um, so reusing and not reinventing um, is, I, the, what I'll say here is um, the California water boards have, you know, we, in the, so we've been talking about reusing code or data um, or, or technical setups. The California water boards reused the whole OpenScapes Champions program infrastructure. And they have now led, they basically forked OpenScapes and have now led OpenScapes with their colleagues internally. And that's just like a wonderful example of reusing and not reinventing. I'm just gonna end on our last one so we can continue along to the demo. I'm sorry, I'm realizing how hard it is for me to shorten these stories. Um, so the last value is, is kindness and how this can emerge through inclusion, creativity, and art. Um, and Don Wright, it, um, who's the chief scientist at Esri, encompasses this value so beautifully. Um, Don was uh, our first guest on our community call series where we got to talk to her about how kindness has showed up in her science and really help amplify and discuss like the importance of the way we work together um, in the scientific community and creating the culture we want. Um, so, you know, this was a quick little run through of these values and something that underpins all of them are the idea of psychological safety and being able to ask questions, give feedback, um, have, a, have people to talk to. It's also another big piece of this is that people have had paid time to learn new skills, to teach each other and to experiment with incorporating new skills and tools into their workflows. Um, and that there's been a lot, it's been a lot of little things that they've done on a daily basis. It's not just one big thing that you're kind of waiting to happen to you someday. It's like taking action on these many little things. So throughout all of this too, you know, open documentation has been key in a lot of these stories. Um, and it's really important for science and storytelling and far beyond. Um, so we share our approaches in 
several places, but these are our main places where we talk about our whole approach. Um, and also we have a lesson series for the Champions Program that has all of our curriculum and you know, we're constantly adding to both of these as we learned. And these were enabled um, through technology, like this, this mindset of having, of being web first, of you know, adding notes and developing things in the open have been really enabled by te technology and specifically with Quarto. Um, and Quarto is something um, that builds on our markdown, which is something that's been around for the last 10 years. And I've had the, the great luck and privilege to be using for 10 years already. So this idea of how, what our markdown is, is able to do helps me even like design the idea for OpenScapes with this web first mindset, which is so exciting to see more and more in science. So what is Quarto? Quarto is a new open source scientific and technical publishing system. And the goal of it is to make the process of creating and collaborating dramatically better. Um, Quarto lets you take your code in, what, in many different languages and it will turn it into these different reporting formats. So like we saw with the Alaska Fishery Science Center team with their, their map of Alaska. Um, and I, I keynoted the global launch of Quarto um, earlier, well, I guess uh, last year. Um, and the reason that I was part of this keynote was that NASA OpenScapes was the first Quarto external user of this um, software. Um, and that's that's um, a you know a story in itself and and told through our keynote here. Um, but it's it's been a wonderful collaboration to actually have me as a R, as somebody with R in my background coming to the NASA Earth Data world that Python is their main um, language and having us be able to interoperate and build documentation and teaching resources using Quarto together and helping contribute even to some of the design of, of Quarto. So um, what I'm going to do with this live demo is to show you in R, in the RStudio um, software, how to develop a small website using the Quarto text file and R code. Then I'm going to show you in JupyterHub how we can add a Jupyter Notebook.ipynb file and some Python code. And, and we'll, we're able to sync, sync between this workflow um, using, um, oh, I can't copy that. I'm going to copy it from over here. Um, using GitHub. OK. Oh, and these are the things that I'm going to show, but we'll just go back. OK. So let me show you this demo. So I'm going to come here to our studio and show you this. Um, this is the RStudio IDE. This, this is the integrative developer environment where I have my kind of editor area here where I can have files open. This is my console where I have the live R process. And then I have a lot of nice um, tools at my disposal on this side. Right now I've got this file pane open um, where these are all the files in this project I'm going to show you that's our website. Um, and then I have a couple panes up here where I'll actually be able to render my website. So what I wanna show you here is that um, this, is, this file, this uh, YAML file kind of gives the architecture of our website. We're gonna have a, a welcome page um, called this index.qmd file and then this hello page. Um, and I'm just, let's look, just look at this hello page um, first. And what this is, is this is a um, text file that combines um, some metadata at the top, but really it's, it's markdown prose um, that I can, I can write in. So if I was writing my fisheries report, I could write my introduction here. And then there's actually code here that this is example, this is example code in R. I can run this code as I go um, and it, it sends my code down to my console so I can load a, um, this Palmer Penguins library that is um, a, a data set of, um, in, in R, we often package data as a code package so that you're able to share data nicely for teaching resources and beyond and, and, and analysis. So 
this example um, file has this mix of markdown text and then a few places where we can run code and actually look at the raw data that's in this penguins data set, for example. Um, this, is, this has been kind of the primary way to interface with these um, Quarto um, files so far, but the visual editor is also a new um, feature that our studio and um, now Posit has released in the last year. And what this does is this lets you see that same file, but more in a notebook uh, um, view. So you can actually see a little bit more about um, what the code looks like as you run it. You, you see the things hyperlinked rather than marked down. Um, you can have your images show up and, and have things kind of here together a little bit more. So what I want to show you, though, is to how to turn this, um, this flat file and you know, this architecture we just looked at into a website. And so Quarto knows, my, the whole RStudio IDE knows that this is a website. So when I press this render website button, I get a little preview here of what our website looks like. So this is this welcome page. And then we can actually look at our Hello Quarto page. And this is, so this is, you know, this rendered view of what our, um, our website looks like. And actually when we looked at the code with the raw data, we can also, uh, anyway, we, had, we were looking at it in several different ways. Um, this is the code that will make a figure. And actually it, the figure has been, the code has been executed and we've got the figure demonstrated here in our little website, which is awesome. One thing, you know, that's all I'm going to say um, about Quarto and um, before we move on, except for one amazing feature, which is around citations. Um, one of the things that the visual editor now supports beautifully is citations. So when I press this at symbol, I'm able to search my whole Zotero library or even paste a DOI. So that's what I just copied. This is the original paper for this Pump or Penguins. And when I, so I'm able to add that right, like um, uh, easily like that through this little interface. And then when I, again, build my website, um, and then let's have a look here. Um, you'll see that this, oh I, oh, I guess I, sorry. I need to actually render the page itself. Um, which is nice so that if you have code, you actually don't wanna run building your website won't um, do it automatically. So that's good. But you'll see that this reference shows up nicely here as well as by default, giving you a reference down here. And this has been so huge for particularly the NOAA groups that we've been working with who are creating annual reports and citations is a huge time um, uh, thing for everyone. Okay, I'm just gonna show you this briefly in our Jupyter Hub as well. Um, this is our Jupyter Hub where, uh, again, it's hosted by 2i2c and we have a Python environment that has, has been uh, set up by Luis Lopez. All of our files are um, that I just had um, in our studio are here. We can pretend that I just synced them using GitHub. Um, and something that I've done here is I've added an IPNB page to our architecture here. And we can look at what that looks like. This is a Jupyter notebook. Um, so it's a similar feel to what we just saw with the Quarto file. And here, um, you know, we, when we run this code, this is, there's a um, Python library also called Palmer Penguins that has um, been built um, by McNacky, um username. Anyway, so we can now see this same kind of orientation in a Jupyter notebook. And when we now come here, there's, no, there's not a button yet to, to press build the website, but we can say Quarto preview from the terminal. And what this will do is give us a URL that we can um, view. I like to kind of put this in a window just to the side. Let me just bring this over here. So this is again our website. Um, now there's this Hello Quarto and Python page, and you'll see that um, it has the same look and feel as our other, as the R 
uh, page that we looked at before. Um, and some one other thing I'll say is that our Jupyter Hub here does not have R installed. And my R instance did not have Python installed, but we're able to interoperate um, to create this, this website together. Um, there's so much more I could demo and share, but we're gonna just get, leave you there with that taste um, and go back and wrap things up because I know we're getting towards time. Um, so this is this is what I just demonstrated is that you can collaborate across coding languages and contribute from your current tools, which has been really phenomenal. Um, so let's return to movement building and kind of what's possible because all of this is, you know, it's, it's great, but what, what is really possible and really what it means is there's more time for science and solutions. Um, this is about time saved, but it's also about better, better products, less um, lost day to day, less things lost when people leave the group, less worry about that bust factor if what would happen if if um, your computer got destroyed. Um, it's also about improved morale. It's about helping people get in, unstuck, uh, building real relationships with colleagues. And it's about climate and social change. It's about really connecting our biggest challenges with our daily activities and work um, and helping us be motivated and connected in that way. So to join, you know, we invite you to join and amplify the open movement. Um, and there's many ways to do this. Um, we have these open educational resources that link to a lot of other communities and activities and resources. So this can be a good place to start. Um, and um, also just, you know, it's, it's about this mindset too, this idea that open science is this daily practice and that you can reuse and not reinvent. Um, this idea of learning together first and like having that kind of seaside chat, um, surfside chat thing where you can um, build that high, higher morale and skills. Um, so I won't walk through all of these here, but I want to just end on the idea of this last point of, you know, really listening to colleagues, learning from each other, borrowing what works, what you, wherever you see it, and then also helping that kind of reimagine the places you're stuck on all different scales. And so to just close on this idea of reimagining and coming back to cephalopods um, and marine animals, since that's um, you know, where I've started. This is a story um, that I got really inspired about over a break about the, the lady and the octopus, which is written by Dana Stoff. This is a story of a, the Argonaut octopus, which is displayed here. They wanted to live life a little differently by being an octopus that lived in the open ocean. Um, and so what they did was build, you know, through evolution, have built a container to enable that vision. So they actually build their own shell and wrap their arms around their head that you can see kind of cascading around their eye there. And they swim around the open ocean. And it's like this awesome octopus that is like doing things differently. And this book um, tells a story of uh, Jean Vilpe Power, who is a um, scientist in France in the 1800s who built aquariums to actually study these and like revolutionized marine science. So it's like really cool um, to see these different places that like spark your interest and help help bring that to your own work to help you reimagine too. So um, I will end there and just say thank you. Uh, this is possible because of so many wonderful people that we work with and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Uh, there are a couple of questions here. The first one is from Alfred. I, I would like to invite people to unmute and ask directly if they uh, would like, otherwise I can. Alfred, would like to do that? Um, yes, I, uh, I lost my connection for a few minutes. So actually I, I lost my uh, question in chat uh, as well. So I try my best to recall my question. Uh, so basically, I think uh, the uh, question has to do with um, my observation that um, OpenScape seems to be more like a social attitude uh, of uh, how science ought to be done and to be more fair, more democratic. Um, the idea of democracy is that everyone has a voice 
um, but uh, that's a good thing. But that also opened the possibility that um, bad data and bad ideas also have a voice in a completely democratic um, society. So, uh, so when science is, science is really that open, how do you win out bad data and bad ideas when uh, everybody has a right to, to make an opinion and, um, and that include bad data and, and bad ideas as well? Mm -hmm. That's a great uh, question. And you know, one of the, the big things that we think about is how open science is really a spectrum in terms of how, how you participate and how, how open it really is. Um, with a lot of the teams that we work with, we, we focus actually on being open within your team first. So within a lab group, um, within a division, you know, in, in a government branch, and how can you be more open with the ways that you're working day to day so that your work is better for everyone? So it's not only about being public. Uh, a lot of the groups we work with are working openly together with their teams, but not openly publicly. And I think that that's really um, a big part of building kind of the trust and and then sort of extending that extending that beyond. So there is a question here in the uh, Google Doc. What is the difference between uh, using Jupyter Notebook versus Quarto? Uh, I'm confused um, when sh how to use which or when. It's a good it's a good question. Um, they are pretty interoperable and growing more so. So, like I showed, you can have you can. You can combine them in the same project. So, like if if your collaborator is using Jupyter, um, a Jupyter notebook, um, that doesn't you know. You, you don't have to use a Jupyter notebook if you if you have a different system already. Um, I think you can also there's a actual function that you can run from the terminal to translate a Quarto document into a Jupyter notebook and back and forth. Um, which has been helpful. That's been one strategy that we've used as we um, use GitHub with Jupyter Notebooks because the Quarto files can be a smaller um, file that works more nicely with version control. Um, I think the idea, that the, but the stepping back, the bigger mindset is that you can use whichever one works for your own workflow right now. Um, you don't have to learn a whole new thing um, in order to use Quarto. So like, if you're already using Jupyter Notebooks, that's great. You can continue doing that and, and still leverage Quarto. Um, in, in the R world, we don't use Jupyter Notebooks as much. Um, we use these Quarto documents. And so that's kind of our starting point, but you know, we don't have, like, we don't have to learn how to use Jupyter Notebooks in order to collaborate with, um, with Jupyter Notebooks, you know, at, and that's not to say we won't, you know, like I've learned so much about Jupyter Notebooks, but it didn't have to be my very first hurdle in order to collaborate. And I think that that's really this like, this power of yet. Any further questions? Someone uh, uh, wrote here that uh, uh, the participant wrote that she or he loved your instructions and is asking how to incorporate them into the presentation, but someone is already answering the, that question. Wonderful, yeah, my colleague, Stephanie Butland. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, Al yeah, so Alison Horst is an amazing artist and data scientist and teacher, and we've been collaborating for years um, on this artwork. Um, it's all available for reuse and remixing um and Steph has links there in the in the doc so thank you Steph Stephanie any uh, questions further questions from the audience please unmute and ask directly to Julia if you'd like we'll do so I just wanted to say thank you so much for this it was really great thank you hope to see you again in other venues Questions? Um, 
Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will skip, usually we have the webinars in a monthly basis, but we'll skip February because there are lots of conflicts. The next web webinar will be March, March the 15th, and people will be receiving more information about it. Thank you again, Julia. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Adni, at all. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Bye -bye.